Common Mystic Prayer, Gabriel Diefenbach Chapter 13 Asceticism and Mysticism Mystical prayer is free of formal method. Its very spirituality precludes such method as might be used, for instance, in meditation. There will accordingly be no schools of mysticism. Its one and only school is that of the Holy Spirit, who teaches and draws the soul from within. Different souls traverse different paths to mystic prayer, but that prayer essentially follows one law, the law of wordless, imageless, heart-to-heart -heart contact with God. God may grant special infusions of grace and divine touches, which enkindle flames of love, but that which constitutes the mystic way is the indefinable communication experienced in the depths of the soul by a simple view of the understanding and a simple movement of the will. And since this is chiefly God's work, there can hardly be human schools of mystic practice. But there are schools of asceticism, for asceticism is the human preparation and cultivation of the ground in which the seed of grace is to fructify. Asceticism has not to do with prayer as such, but with ways of spiritual training. The ascetic side is, therefore, the side of the soul's natural activity and proposes for practice whatever is necessary to build up the structure of Christian perfection. The schools of asceticism are distinguishable by the emphasis placed on particular doctrines and ways of life, or by the distinctive spirit imparted by the various religious founders. Each order or congregation inherits a characteristic spirit and work to do. Each has its own method of training and perfection, though all aim at fostering divine union, including preparation for mystic union. However, the mystical life is not a continuation of the ascetical life in the sense that when the former is found, the latter ceases. On the contrary, ascetic practice goes on step by step with mystic prayer. But with the appearance of the latter, the ascetic phase assumes a more passive character. The soul denies itself, certainly, but not with such positive joy in the performance of particular acts. Rather, it experiences a general act of renunciation, a habitual disposition of universal detachment, in which the demands of the inferior nature lose their strength. Besides, the soul now sees the superiority of God's work over its own, the disposition of His providence in which the soul suffers abandonment or darkness, various moral and spiritual sufferings. It is further mortified by its own interior humiliations, its consciousness of its many hidden faults and failures in practicing virtue, and in reacting to the sudden and unexpected trials that come from the circumstances of daily life. All this is felt by the soul to work a more purifying effect than its own feeble efforts. Self-activity becomes cooperation in which the soul yields itself more to the action of another, who moves the will sweetly in all things, giving it strength and facility in the way of the cross. The soul no longer seems to wish for anything in particular, but rather in simplicity of spirit, refers all to the love of God. This apparently is the most noticeable characteristic of the spiritual life of contemplatives. Instead of loving God for intelligible reasons, instead of serving Him throughout the day for definite motives, they feel they are carried along by grace. And very quickly their main practice comes to be a simple abandonment to the divine will in everything. But even though the action of God gains the ascendancy, a careful self-denial and watch over the senses must be maintained, lest the desires of sense come quickly 
to the fore again. Immortification, pandering to sense, dissipation of spirit, cultivation of attachments, self-will, worldliness, each and all of these stifle the language of mystic prayer, silencing the divine voice in the depths of the soul. Any willful, unrejected attachment to an imperfection will be contrary to that pureness and liberty of spirit requisite for enjoying the calm, loving knowledge of God. When the human will is disattuned, however slightly, to the divine, it cannot rest in that peaceful, loving attention to God, which is the characteristic activity of ordinary mystic prayer. In this passive way, all comes eventually to be given up for the beloved. Renunciation will acquire breadth and depth, eating at the very roots of self. Little by little, God will try the soul, moving from renunciation to renunciation, and these of an ever more interior and purifying nature, stripping it of natural inclinations and aversions, of the good opinion it may have of itself, or any self-conceived perfection, goodness, or spirituality, or even of the perception of its own progress. One by one, these tags by which the soul clings to tangible support are taken away. Thus, progress in the interior way is a progress by losses. This is God's method of reforming the supernatural character and the soul by its cooperation, by its submission and consent to the purifying action of God, undergoes in this manner a more passive asceticism than that ordinarily practiced outside the mystical life. Surely our Lord gently invites loved ones to a generous surrender of themselves to Him, a surrender of all their ideas, preferences, likes and dislikes, petty ambitions, self-seeking of every kind, that He may be all in all to them in loving union. Seek, and you shall find, He says. Knock, it shall be opened to you. When we have knocked by earnest persevering effort at prayer by holy desires, self-denial, and the like, there remains only the willing submission to the touch of God's hand as it works the more passive and penetrating purifications. But, as has been so aptly remarked, most people do not progress much beyond a well-directed cultivation of self for God. They build up their character admirably, but it is their character. They will not lose all, including self, to find all, and so they remain in the middle passage. Such a losing of self is a most happy loss, resulting only in a finding of self again in the Beloved, with whom it becomes one mind, one will, one loving heart. So too thought the lovers in the poem which the Abbé Brimont quotes in Prayer and Poetry, the lover knocks at the door of the beloved, and a voice replies from within, Who is there? It is I, he said, and the voice replied, There is no room for thee and me in this house, and the door remained shut. Then the lover returned to the desert, and fasted and prayed in solitude. After a year he came back and knocked once more at the door. Once more the voice asked, Who is there? He replied, It is thyself, and the door opened to him. It is ordinary contemplation and mystic prayer that gives the facility for such wholehearted surrender of self. To the will it communicates inclination and strength to do whatever the beloved requires. To the mind, light to know there is nothing safer, better, sweeter than the utter, irrevocable gift of self to that holy, an ineffable being, who has made the weak creature worthy to share the lot of the saints in light. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 Visions, Voices, and Mystic Prayer The tendency to confuse visions and revelations with mystic prayer is, it may be hoped, constantly diminishing. It may still linger where there has been no trouble taken to investigate the true character of mysticism. 
visions and locutions are phenomena which, most probably, never make their appearance in the lives of the greater number of people enjoying contemplative prayer. In themselves they may not be uncommon. To meet with seers and prophets, or at least with people who have met them, is more usual than might be supposed. The writer has known individuals claiming to be recipients of visions or revelations. One at least gave no sign of possessing a grace of contemplative prayer and could scarcely be called a mystic. Again, very good persons, and some even destined for high sanctity, have beheld apparitions and heard voices outside of mystic prayer. St. Joan of Arc was guided by voices which seemingly came to her apart from prayer. These voices, speaking to her from the other world, were the inspiration of her mission, and they directed her infallibly as they were from God. Nothing is mentioned in her life about mystical prayer and union, though presumably she had it. So with St. Bernadette. She beheld the Queen of Heaven many times in external visions, yet there is no indication of mystic prayer in connection with these appearances, though she was absorbed by them to such an extent as to be insensible of what was happening around her. There is thus no necessary connection between visions, voices, and mystic prayer. Mystic prayer is obscure, intangible, indistinct, without image, form, or figure, and has no intrinsic affinity for visions or revelations. The visionary can describe his experience in particular and definite image and language the mystic cannot. Whatever is definite, clearly seen, and able to be apprehended in form or figure comes through the channels of sense and is therefore non-mystic and purely accessory. Of course, many of the greatest saints and mystics had these unusual experiences. Frequently, indeed, these have tended to obscure the thing of real interest and value in their lives, their prayer. How often we hear about St. Margaret Mary's visions of the Sacred Heart. How seldom about the long hours she spent in loving repose before God. Repose which was her true life, her main occupation, her mystic prayer. In the case of so many who have been subject to extraordinary phenomenon, there have been contradictions, non-fulfillment of prophetic utterances, misinterpretations, even disedification of life. This fact, together with a mistaken tendency to label these persons mystics, when perhaps they have never experienced the mystic union, is at least partly accountable for any distaste or distrust associated with the word and subject of mysticism. The frequent deception in regard to visions and voices, or their meaning, has made even saints wonder on occasion whether these experiences were from God, self, or devil. And they have more than once erred in interpretation. It is so easy to intrude one's own spirit. Furthermore, these things possess no great efficacy or power in themselves to sanctify and deepen the soul's union with God, nor can they in any manner be truly like unto Him. So the wise soul loses no time in so much as even testing the spirits to see whether or not they are of God, but passes on direct to God, who is apprehended only in that general, indistinct, indescribable, obscure, loving knowledge, which is far more sanctifying than extraordinary and incidental phenomena. When we have this, we have God. And we cannot be deceived, as in visions and voices, for the mystic union can come neither from self nor from evil spirit, which uses sense operations, but only from God. And it takes place in the inner chamber of the soul, where sense cannot penetrate, nor the devil enter in, but where the divine guest alone dwells. End of chapter 14